actually his line of thinking would be rational in that regard. In my way of thinking, this is a relatively common feature. I mean, I looked at his imaging studies, and I, I was hardly impressed with anything there uh, as being in need of any surgery, either now or in the near future. Now, 10 years from now, it, it might be something that progresses. From my perspective, if it did progress, it's not related to the car accident. So I, I wouldn't consider a patient such as him as someone having to come back to me to check in every year, like, say, someone with a brain tumor uh, or otherwise. In fact, patients I've operated on for spinal stenosis, once they've gotten better, I don't make them come back every year. What could I possibly do if they come back every year other than to tip my hat to them? They can call me on the phone if they, you know, and then they do if they want some refill on some medications like COX-2 inhibitors and things of that ilk, but I don't make them come back and see me on a routine basis. I'm not their family physician. Family physicians you go to see you know, every year for checkups. You get routine physicals. I already know what the problem is, particularly, say, in a patient such as this, and if they start having more back and leg pain, then I would expect them to perhaps want to come back, but not on a routine basis. All right. I'm not going to say that that's wrong, though. I think I've already addressed right. that. If he wants to do it, um, so be it. So, so what I'm getting from you then is that there, there may be some differences of opinion between, for, uh, as to future treatment follow-up. Yeah, I, I think he's time. been very thoroughly worked up. I can't think of any future treatment here to do for things related to this car accident. You know, concussion, aches and pains, uh, things of that ilk. The spinal stenosis, like I said, might need some treatment in the future, but I, but I would not be willing personally. And again, that goes back to the to the fundamental nature of the way I approach degenerative changes of the spine and their relationship to vehicular trauma, um, I'm not going to suggest that spinal stenosis that gets worse when he's 65 is related to a car accident that occurred in 2002. Right. And are there any other issues that you um, have uh, questions about or concerns about with regard to the future care and treatment? whether it be prescriptions or testing or anything like that? No, I, I think, as I said, I think he was very thoroughly worked up. I can't think of another thing to do here. Okay. What I'm saying is if he continues to be on, a, on Celebrex or a, a, a drug that similar, to that similar to that, that does require testing, do you have an issue with the liver testing that has to be done? Um, I don't know of any uh, constant ongoing liver testing that needs to be done with Celebrex. I think... Uh, uh, if, if people have concomitant problems, but uh, you know, if there's some aspect of his need for follow-up relating to one of the drugs he's on for uh, pain, then I would certainly wouldn't object to that. Sounds reasonable. Okay, so if Dr. House, I mean, I'm not getting LFTs on patients on a yearly basis who are on uh, anti-inflammatory agents. Now, perhaps their family doctors may be doing some of that, but I'm not. Okay. I, but, I don't know of any guidelines for that yet. All right. So Dr. Howe, though, says that he, he feels like that's needed uh, in Mr. Crawford's what, case. LFTs, liver function tests? Yes. Do you, you have no issue well, with that? Well, no, I'm not going to argue that point. But I'm, I'm not familiar with a, a set um, uh, evaluation schedule for uh, such. Okay. Perhaps I'm just ignorant. I believe that's all I have, Doctor. Thank you. Dr. Weiss, are your charges for an evaluation like this uh, in line with those of your peers in the medical community as far as you know? Uh, I, I don't really have any mechanism for checking that. I think, if anything, they're uh, either in line or less. I, I don't think they're excessive. Okay. Uh, based on Mr. Crawford's diagnostic studies, would you have expected his complaints of pain to resolve by now? I would think so, but again, I've been disappointed in that regard uh, with others. And you mentioned motivational factors. Um, having a lawsuit pending over a vehicular accident for money damages is a motivational factor, is it not? No, I'll object to that. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's so much litigation and there, there's so much open room there to uh, discuss what's motivational. I'm just not sure I could. 
can it be a candidly practice? opine on that? I, I suppose anything could be motivational. In other words, what I was suggesting by that comment was uh, someone who you know needs to get back to the workplace because no one else can do the work. Uh, you know, they're not working in a, a large group of individuals. Um, that might be a motivational factor to get back sooner than than you might necessarily want to or could uh, ideally. Um, Emotional, financial factors certainly could have a, a, a factor in that, but again, I'm no expert in all of that. And, do you and see, I, don't, I don't know how much money is involved or, or what. Do you see patients who um, feel like they have to get back to the workplace, not only because there's nobody to do the work, but also to put food on the table? Well, you see again, that's, that's what I was implying by you know, yeah. you know emotional, financial, uh, social factors. I mean, I imagine there are a lot of factors that go into that, and. You know, as physicians, we see all types of folks. No further questions. I don't have anything further. Thank you. Good luck. That's the end of the Thank videotape deposition, Dr. Weiss, time two fifty. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break right now. It's been about an hour and a half, so uh, we'll take about a ten-minute break. It's ten after now. We'll start back at twenty after leaving. Notebooks on your chairs, please. And reassemble in the jury assembly room at twenty after. Stand for jury, please. <coughs> Status of Mr. Mensel? I believe he will be here at uh, approximately 445. All right. What's your next uh, item of proof? A 33 minute deposition of Dr. Parsons. Your Honor, I was going to make, um, at some point, I'll make this deposition of Dr. Weiss with the exhibits an exhibit. I don't know if, if Mr. Freeman was planning to do that or not. I have not. Uh, I mean, I don't mind making the dep deposition. For identification purposes, I do have an issue with this report. I don't. I think that doesn't come in under any hearsay exception since it was uh, a consultant and not a treating physician. And I made that objection on the record. Your Honor, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and we admitted a letter from Dr. Howell. Um, so you know, I don't. I think it's the same thing. I'm not familiar letters. with the number on the uh, rules of evidence for good for the goose, good for the game. <laughs> you remind me of that. Yeah, the, uh, I guess if I was in federal court, I could point to the catch-all. But, uh, uh, you know, if we're, if they stand on the same footing. And so if, if one is in, I think both are in. Well, you were given an opportunity to object if you wanted to. Right. And uh, no, I, I don't know if it's too late, but uh, I kind of assumed they were both coming in because... They, both, they were both letters from, from physicians in the case. I, I definitely didn't want to give Mr. Gilmore the wrong impression, and that's why on the record in his deposition I made that objection known. And, again, I think it's pretty clear. If, it's, if the document is not for treatment and diagnosis in Tennessee, in the Tennessee Rules of Evidence, it, it shouldn't come in. May I, may I see the proposed exhibit? Yes, John.
This is a letter dated November 15, 2004, and there's another one November 23, 2004, both of which are addressed to Mr. Gilmore from Dr. Weiss, basically detailing his findings. Yes, sir. I sustain the objection. Uh, it would be hearsay. Uh, it was not. Uh, a, it's obviously an out-of-court statement. It's being introduced for the truth. The matter is the only possible relevance it could come in for. Uh, and it was not a report made for purposes of medical diagnosis and treatment as required by the Tennessee Rules of Evidence Act. Uh, the fact that you know, Dr. Howell's letter was received without objection doesn't automatically yeah. open the gate for everybody else to bring any other yeah. inadmissible evidence faced with objection. And uh, I'll be glad to mark it for identification purposes if you'd like me to, Mr. Gilmore. Um. Yes, that'd be. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to just make it a collective. Is that all right with you? That's fine. All right. I'll stand them together. That's going to be marked as exhibit number B for identification only. Now, um, I assume there's no objection to his CV coming in. It was made exhibit one. I don't have any objection to his CV coming in, Your Honor. That's just a resume. It's going to be received as exhibit number two. We'll pass that up, please. <clears throat> Any other exhibits to the deposition? No, Your Honor. I don't. I don't know if, if there's any reason that the court wants to make the deposition itself exhibit for identification well, or not. I would have you all understand. Everything that's on the video is is on the record now yeah. because it's recorded under the CD. And so, if you want to, you can. It just makes the file thicker, and it's going to mean the cost is going to cost more. But that was so many per pages. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, Mr. Freeman. Uh, definitely. Yes. Okay. All right. We'll start back at 20 after. Give you give about five more minutes, and let's play your deposition, then we'll break, then we'll take up the uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell situation, okay? Thank you.